All right, everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be talking about America Online, or better known as just AOL. This might be the first time many of you have heard the name AOL in years, and a lot of people probably assume AOL is just a dial up internet provider. I mean, that's mostly what I remember it for. But there was a lot more to this company, and I'll cover as much as I can in this video. So I'll just try to hit on all the key points and events so I don't make this video too incredibly long. By the way, thank you for the video suggestion, and if anyone else has a suggestion for a future video, please let me know about it in the comments. America Online was a giant in the early days of the internet. In fact, they pioneered a lot of the things that we take for granted today. So just to be clear, AOL does still exist, just in a much lower capacity than they did in the 90s. Some people still use their email services, and apparently some people still use their search engine, as a small handful of people find my videos via AOL.com. Anyways, they've seen a lot through the years, from dial-up internet service, to an email provider, and even an instant messenger. They've also had some aggressive advertising campaigns, and a few acquisitions along the way. The roots for AOL go all the way back to 1983. That was the year that William von Meister created a company called Central Video Corporation, or CVC for short. CVC's main product was something called GameLine. It was actually an online-based internet game service for the Atari 2600. But it wasn't for online multiplayer, as you might suspect. It was for downloading and renting video games. It did seem like a pretty good concept but it wasn't well received with the Atari gamers. That's most likely because of the cost. The modem was $49.99 with a $15 activation fee. On top of that, you had to pay a rental fee for each game that you rented. There wasn't any flat rate. Von Meister was struggling to keep the service active, so he approached Warner Brothers about adding music downloads to the game line service. But eventually Warner Brothers would reject his offer and by 1985, GameLine was scrapped. Shortly after, Von Meister would leave the company. In May of 1985, the company would shift to a new service. This time, they were focused on the personal computer industry, opposed to the video game market. The company would hire former Pizza Hut executive Steve Case to be their marketing director. Anyways, they would launch the new service in late 1985. It was called Quantum Link, or Q-Link for short. With this new service, you could dial in and be connected to a few different programs. You would be connected to an interface where there was news, weather, software, games, and even an online message board. It was pretty innovative, but it was still a fairly limited experience. Q-Link was compatible with the Commodore 64, as at that time, that computer was the most affordable home computer system selling for just around $600. By the way, throughout the 80s, there were nearly 17 million Commodore 64 computers sold. That's just crazy. Fast forward to 1988. Q-Link was modified to work on both Apple and IBM computers. Of course, the name was changed to Apple Link and PC Link respectively. These services were pretty cool. However, they were still targeted mostly towards colleges and business owners. Apple Link, for example, was said to be just for authorized dealers, so it was still a fairly limited demographic. Everything would change in 1991. This was the year that the service was once again modified. This time, it was modified to work on the popular operating system, DOS. And with that, Q-Link was officially changed to America Online. Another big event for the company was in 1992. This was the year that America Online was compatible with Windows. They are becoming very popular around this time, with an estimated 200,000 users, and they would take the company public in March of 1992, with an IPO of 11.50 a share. 1993 was a big year for them. Not only could you create your own at AOL.com email address, but they also started a new advertising campaign. This campaign was called Carpet Bombing. Where they came up with the name, I have no idea, but it was very effective. This campaign was the idea of Jan Brandt. She got a lot of pushback from executives, 
mostly because of the costs associated with it, but at the end of the day, she got the go-ahead and the campaign was launched. And I'm sure most of you remember this. It was the mass amount of AOL CDs that were sent in the mail, and they were free at retail stores. These things were everywhere. I remember getting them in the mail. They came in like a little metal tin. This had to cost a lot of money, but it was very effective. In fact, they would grow to over 1 million subscribers by the end of 1994, and they would pass ProdigyNet as the number one internet provider. By the way, it was said that almost 50% of all CDs produced in the mid-90s were AOL CDs. I can't even comprehend that. That's just crazy. And as a side note here, the CDs that you received in the mail not only had the AOL software on them, but they also included free hours. At this point, most internet providers weren't unlimited. You just got an hourly limit each month. In 1995, they acquired a search engine called Webcrawler, and they integrated it into their software. So for the first time, you were able to log into AOL and search for anything you wanted. Granted, most sites available were either educational or news websites, but nonetheless, it was a step in the right direction. And with that, AOL would explode. They grew to over 5 million users. In 1996, they got rid of their hourly limit. AOL was now unlimited for $19.99 a month. They were among the first internet providers to do so. In 1997, AOL was bundled with Windows. This was huge for them as Windows 98 was just around the corner. And with that, AOL would grow to over 10 million users. But they soon realized they had a problem. They just had too many users. And busy signals were a common occurrence. So major upgrades would be needed if they wanted to continue and grow. I also wanted to mention the launch of AIM. That was in 1997. It was their instant messenger service. It was very similar to both Yahoo and MSN Messenger. However, AIM would be discontinued in 2017. I didn't mention ICQ because AOL would actually go on to purchase them in later years. In 1998, they bought the internet browser Netscape Navigator for $4.2 billion. At that time, Netscape was a direct competitor with Internet Explorer. In 1999, they bought MapQuest for a reported $1.1 billion. And later in 1999, they created their own search engine called NetFind. It would later be rebranded to AOL.com, and that is actually still the same search engine that they use nowadays. So obviously, they were a very popular internet provider at this time. But I always had blue light internet service from Kmart. You could pick up a free CD at the checkout. I'm curious, does anybody else remember this? At this point, they were a giant in the industry, and they had the value to prove it. It was reported that AOL was valued at $125 billion. That's billions with a B. However, some experts warned this value might actually be inflated, as many tech companies at that time were actually being overvalued. But none of this would stop AOL from buying Time Warner for $182 billion in the year 2000. With this purchase, AOL would control 55% of the new company, and AOL executive Steve Case would become the CEO. The new name for the company? AOL Time Warner. Very original. On paper, this acquisition made a lot of sense, as Time Warner had their own broadband internet called Roadrunner. But the thing is, Roadrunner service would never be rebranded or really integrated with AOL. It basically just operated as normal. In fact, it started to take away AOL's dial-up customers, as one might suspect, so it's kind of turning out not to be such a good thing. Around this time, the dot-com bubble would burst. If you're not familiar with that, basically, internet companies were being way overvalued, Investors were basically putting money into them because they were the next big thing. It made it look like they were more valuable than they actually were, basically regardless of their value. So it kind of hurt everybody in the long run. In 2002, AOL Time Warner would lose $98 billion. That's billions with a B. In fact, their stock price would drop from $56 a share 
down to just $14, and Steve Case would be replaced as CEO. They would continue to operate this way for a while, and at this point, AOL had a website, search engine, email, and instant messenger. I mean, they did still have a dial-up internet service, but that was quickly becoming obsolete. They would just continue to struggle, and they would start to lose a lot of ad revenue as well. There was a lot of competition, with companies such as Google, Yahoo, and MSN. In 2009, AOL was separated from Time Warner, and they were spun off into their own company. And just a few years later, in 2011, AOL would purchase the Huffington Post. Anyways, in 2015, AOL would be sold to Verizon for $4.4 billion, and that's pretty much where they stand today. As I mentioned, they do still exist, but they're just not the same company that they were back in the 90s and the early 2000s. I guess there still could be a place for them in the market, but I think they would have to make some major changes to stay competitive. Anyway guys, that's all I have for today's video. That's the story of AOL. If you had AOL back in the day, let me know about your experience. And if you have any suggestions for a future video, please let me know about it in the comments. If you guys like this video, please give me a like. And if you like this kind of content, please subscribe to my channel. I'm trying to come out with new videos every single week. So I will see you all next week. Thanks for watching.